טוב, שנה טובה, everyone. שנה טובה מתוגה. The second day of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, once again, uh, we don't have you here all physically, although it's a blessing to have at least you here for part. And uh, we feel your presence regardless. And hopefully these words here will give some inspiration, some, some reflection, you know, during this challenging time, ongoing challenging time. All right. So recently, some of you know, of course, many of you know, that I, and actually now Rabbi Jenny, we are involved in a local North Raleigh clergy group. And it's a wonderful group of various religious traditions and mainly the churches and a mosque in this kind of, uh, our area, in this kind of part of Northeast Raleigh, might call it even, uh, together, together uh, and we continue, even during the pandemic, to get together uh, on Zoom, just like everyone else is. And during a recent meeting, there was one member of the group who, <laughs> you can understand, has started serving a new church during the pandemic. So he has barely, I mean, he's met his members over time, outside, you know, the whole thing. But he's not even experienced what it's like to have his community at all. And there are some people in our shul have had this. We have people in our own shul working for our shul, including who have had, not had the full experience. And there are people who have moved to Raleigh or Beth Meyer or started new jobs. You know what it's like. But, you know, tough, particularly in our business, where we're community people and getting to know people. And so one of the lines he said about the experience that he's had, really have all had, coming somewhere new, hard to meet people, the mat came in, hard to identify people because of the masks. And then we had this tease this summer, you know, got vaccinated, the vast majority, I'm happy to say, in our community and the Jewish community in general, yes, appeared we could begin to do some things back to some sense of normal, and then the breakthroughs and all the challenges, as we know all too well. It's kind of like this back and forth. And what he described it as, using a baseball metaphor, as he said, it felt to me that I came ready for a regular baseball game, and when it reached the ninth inning, and I thought it was the end, all of a sudden, someone came over to, to me and said, it's going to be a double header. And for those of you who are baseball fans, know exactly what that is. For those who don't oh, know, the Rashi on that is a doubleheader is when you play two games in a row. So what he said, I think, is quite profound. Because many of us felt like we put in the time of the waiting, we put in the time of masking and acting, I hope for the mass majority of us, like Menches, and it seemed like we'd be rewarded for that. And then we were told, not so fast. Now we may have to continue. In fact, we are continuing to wait. And this idea of waiting, you know, a double header, the tease of the end, kind of the tease of the promised land, but then being told you have to go back to wander. This idea of wandering for a long time, not able to make it to our promised land, you know. This, if I just say kind of like, what are the top few skill sets that our people has in our memory, in our Torah, something that our people knows very well. I'm not saying we're not an impatient people. I believe me, patience is not my, my best. But our people understands what it means to have to wait. Our people understands we have a kind of spiritual skill set of what it means to yearn deeply for something to happen and then either to be told or to realize it's not going to happen on our schedule or very quickly. And you know when I say this, you know it well. First of all, there's the famous thing on the Passover Seder. I say it for the wink, right? There's the four questions. Why do we recline? Why matzah? Why is this night different? And the fifth question, when do we eat? No, that was just a joke, okay? But the idea is, a lot of our rituals take time. The machzor can be long. It takes a while to get to the end. There's a reason behind that, by the way. Time takes reflection, but it's long. The Passover Seder. It also can be a little bit long, okay? But those are kind of more the uh, light ones. The more serious ones, we've been waiting 2,000 years or more for the Mashiach, for the Messiah. We know what it means to yearn for that day when peace will be on earth, to do all we can to bring peace on earth. But to realize that uh, shalom is still far from us doesn't mean we can desist from the work, as Pierre Kevot says, but we know what it's like to wait. We know what it's like to be in exile from our land. You know, our story of our people is originally in the land of Israel. And then we had to go on our wanderings throughout the world. 
And thank God it, we were restored in 1948, but we understand what it means to be nearly 2,000 years waiting, just waiting for history and life to change. But probably the most famous, like when we say about waiting and yearning in our tradition, the most famous one is when we were in Egypt and we were enslaved and then we got ready to go on the way to the promised land. According to the book of Deuteronomy, in a very famous pasuk, chapter 1, right in the beginning, verse 2, it says, When we left Egypt finally and ready to go to the promised land, it should have been an 11-day journey, specifically from Mount Sinai, 11 days of walking to Kadesh Barnea, right into the edge of the land of Israel. It should have been 11 days. But how long did it take? 40 years. That story, that is our people's story. We know what it means to say, wait a second, you guys are people saying, Moshe, it's, can we just turn over here? It's just 11 days away. But God makes us go and wait. And te- you imagine the tease of it. Like probably some people could kind of see a little bit of it or think it's not that far, but then being told, no, got to go this way. It's kind of like when you think the vaccine, they're going to solve the problem. I'll maybe need a booster. Maybe we got to uh, put masks back on. It's like a tease of the potential and then being pulled back. We have been through that before. And what I want to offer here, specifically around our wandering, is what I believe to be the deepest spiritual wisdom on that, to hopefully for us to have some inspiration, to think in a new way about what it means to have to wait such a long time for this period this COVID period, to be over. So there are three reasons given, or two classic reasons, and one mystic, Kabbalistic reason, of why we wandered, I want to bring forward. The, the classic explanation, the Torah says it's called the Pshat, very direct, why we wandered so long, is it was a punishment. You remember the story, I'm sure, back in the book of Numbers, in Shlach Lecha, we send out spi- Moshe, Moshe sends out spies to check out the land, see what's going on, 12 spies, they see these, there's people in the land. Uh, the, the land's built of milk and honey. Also, it looks good, but the people were scared. Ten of the spies say, Oy vey, forget it. We can't do it. They are giants. We're going to get crushed. Just forget it. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they say, yes, we can, but they're overwhelmed. We'll say by the other ten. So one uh, statement or one commentary or one actually direct quote in the Torah is we're made to wander because of the ten uh, spies that spoke poorly about the land of Israel, basically God said to him, here's your punishment. You don't like what the land has to offer? You can wait a long time to get there. Okay, that's the first kind of classic shot. There's a second reason brought more by the Midrash and by the commentary. And this one also so many of you are, are familiar as well. Another explanation says, well, it wasn't so much a punishment because we spoke poorly or we're wandering just for, I don't know, some kind of self-inflicted, you know, kind of like a teaching via that way. The issue is more kind of uh, leadership oriented. One idea, and I think it's quite profound, and many of you I think who are in business and all aspects of your life can appreciate this, is that the teaching is that the generation that was in Egypt, uh, that was enslaved, the generation that suffered directly and yearned to be free, that leadership, that, that people, were not going to be the same people and leaders we're going to be able to enter the land and create a new society and a new country. The group that experienced the pain, the suffering, had its own wisdom, its own teaching, its own dot, you might say. <clears throat> but we needed new leaders and a new generation to come forward who went to the promised land. In fact, that's one of the teachings why Moses wasn't allowed in. Aside from what you read in the Torah, some believe they say Moshe was a great leader to get us out of Egypt, even to wander. But he wasn't good necessarily to be the right leader when we get into the land. That was Joshua. So this idea of the time taking was actually a time for a new generation to arise in leadership. It's a second classic explanation. But I want to give you the third. The third classic explanation of why it took us so long and why we wandered is from the Kabbalists. It's from the mystics. And I want to focus on one particular Kabbalist, Jewish mystic teacher, Rabbi Yitzchak Loria, also known as the Ari, and those who have been to Israel and Sfat know there's a specific shul, a Beit Knesset, a synagogue, that was like his synagogue, and he has spent time in Sfat. He was from Spain, he was exiled, and he went to Sfat, and he was himself 
a tremendous scholar and a progenitor of mysticism and interpretations, mystic interpretations on his own. He wrote many books and uh, on the subject of, of, of Kabbalah. And he has a specific teaching, follow me here, some of you may be familiar, about what his take is, what his perspective mystically is on creation. Of course, very appropriate again, because it's Rosh Hashanah about the creation of the world. So check this out. I'm not going to give you the whole thing because, honestly, it's quite complex and a bit esoteric, and you definitely can Google it up, and afterwards, maybe the rest of Rosh Hashanah, read about it because it's fascinating. But this is the basic, basic idea, big adult. Here's what he says. He says, in the beginning of the world, put the Torah to the side for the moment, just speaking about God. In the beginning, all there was was God. And God was not, and never is, a thing, like something you can touch, not a man in the sky with a beard. God is the life force of the universe. God is the energy that gives life to the world. But all there was in the entirety of the cosmos was God. And in a sense, that's all there was, that all there needed to be. But at some point, God... Again, now I'm speaking here uh, anthropomorphically, but again, it's all metaphor. God recognized that God wanted there to be a created world that's not just God all by God's self, so to speak, but another entity that we now call, you know, the earth, the sun, the moon, the planets, human beings, etc. And now we follow the Torah. So how God, the question that Kabbalists ask is, if everything's God and God is filling every single corner of the universe, where is there any space for creation? How can there be a creation? It, how can God let there be space for creation? So according to Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, his theory, his theology is, God had to do tzim tzum. God had to contract God's self, so to speak, kind of create some space, a little bit in the corner of the universe, for there to be the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the snake, etc. And to create that space, God had to actually pull back some of God's presence and allow a new space to develop. Now that space, since it was formerly filled with God, in itself would have God energy in it. It's not that it was devoid of God, but God had to do some pulling back to let the children, the new people, start to grow. Some parents, maybe you can get into this metaphor, teachers as well, right? Let the creation go forward. God had to pull back. Okay, so you get there's a space in the cosmos that's ready for creation on Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Well, how are things going to be created? How is that going to have any energy? How are things going to get started? What's the prime mover that pushes this to happen? According to the Kabbalistic read of, of the RE, God took a very powerful beam of light from God's self and shined it like a laser beam into that part of the cosmos where creation was going to take place. And the idea, ideally, was God was going to shine this, uh, this light of love and kindness and gavura and all the things called spherot, for those who are familiar, into the world, all this love energy, creative energy, and it would create this amazing created world. Well, according to the RE, when that light went into that space, which was this very unique space. It was formerly filled with God. Now it still has some of God's presence, a Rashimu, but, now, but it's in a new, it was a very, uh, it was a very, uh, say, unstable place spiritually. It's a new place. When that light of God came in, that creative energy came in to create things, it was too overwhelming for that space. That space couldn't handle all that light, all of God's energy. And what happened? There was an explosion. Some would call this, by the way, a big bang, okay? A big bang, a destructive explosion, because the light was too strong. And what happened after that are little shards of light, little sparks of light that were shot out because of the overwhelming strength of God's light that couldn't be contained in this new world were scattered throughout the created world. So the world did, in the end, start, but it started through something 
explosive, some might even say a little bit destructive, and it's scattered throughout the world, divine sparks of light. Now follow me here. One last piece, I'm going to tell you what I think it means for us here. The last piece he says, the Ari says, so what is our job? Our job as Jews is to go throughout our lives looking, seeking those divine sparks of light, those divine sparks of God, you might say. And they are hidden throughout the earth, throughout the world. Most of the time, the Ari will say, we don't notice them. They are hidden from our eye. But on occasion, we see and experience and even capture and understand fully in the depth of our soul those sparks of hidden light in the course of our lives. All right, let's come back. What does this have to do with the wandering? I said in the beginning, we wandered because of the spies. We wandered because of new generation. What's the wandering to deal with this creation story? Well, according to the RE, here's the take home. We had to wander for a long time because the goal of the wandering was not simply to get to the promised land. Although that's where we were going <laughs> and we want to get there eventually. Please God. The goal of the wandering is to look for sparks of light. And sometimes it takes time to really sit and reflect and breathe and look at the world in a certain way where you can find those sparks of light. Because if you travel too quickly, you may just be blinded to the sparks of light. So his read on the wandering. Why do we wander so long? Because our people had a lot of sparks of light that we had to capture before we could get into the promised land. Okay, that's all theoretical. Let me now bring it down to say, what does this mean for us here right now as we wait? What I want to say is, all of us, including me, Rabbi Jenny, everyone here, everyone in the world, we are sick of wandering and not being in the promised land of being post-COVID. Believe me, I'd like to be there quick too. I am not saying that God is making us wait because there's a perp, you know, that's not my theology. But what I am saying, and I know this for myself, and you here in this shul have taught this to me, is that this period of waiting and yearning and wandering is giving us an opportunity to see divine sparks that we may not have seen under other circumstances. Let me give you just one example in our community. In our community in the past couple of years, sadly, there's been a relatively young parent, a mom, who is struggling with a major, serious, uh, potentially life-threatening health issue. She has, she's married, thank God, very supportive family and husband, and has children can only imagine the, the pain, the fear, the concern that she has faced dealing with her health condition, serious health condition, raising a family, she's a professional, d under normal circumstances. Then you add in having to deal with treatments, hospital visits, emergency situations during COVID when all of us are trying our best, except for those that work in the medical field, essentially to avoid uh, medical situations or the hospital afraid of getting COVID, she has to go into those places much more than she would like because that's what's giving her the medicine, the support, the medical support, et cetera, to live. She's in a clearly an anxious and difficult place. And I have been talking with her as well as Rabbi Jenny over the course of many years about this journey. And she has remarkably, with the support and with her own prayer life, with her own community, she has found a way to be strong, remarkably courageously strong during this time. But what she said to us, me particularly, in a recent meeting just blew me away. And it defined for me what I would call finding the divine sparks in the wandering and in the waiting. 
She had gone through some treatments. She was weak, dizzy. She, her eating was terrible. She wanted to be there for her kids, you know, during this all the virtual school. But she said to me, she said, you know what, uh, Rabbi? When I was in the hospital getting my treatments, when I was sitting there with a mask and everyone around is trying to stay distant and I feel like I'm going to a hospital, which at so many signs, people are dying in the ICU. People have COVID all around. What occurred to me was, how blessed am I? I'll be honest, when she said that, I thought, that's crazy. What do you mean how blessed you are? How privileged I am, Rabbi. I am in a country and in a city with tremendous medical care. I am getting the best medical care possible, even under COVID. We are not wealthy beyond compare, but we have enough to provide me the chance to get this medical care and at the same time not have to work to allow me to take care of my kids as I'm able to and also take this time off for our treatments. Thank God for my partner and his work. How blessed are we? When I was sitting there in the hospital getting treatments, becoming weak, all I could kept thinking about was how many people are not as lucky and fortunate as I am? And she said, you know what this has taught me more than ever is to be grateful for our country, be grateful for medical professionals, be grateful for our hospitals, be grateful for where I live, for our city, for my children, for my husband, for how fortunate and blessed I am. Remember, she didn't say, God gave this to me. This is the reason I got sick. No, that's not what we're saying. What we are saying is she was able to find divine sparks of light that under normal circumstances, she, nor frankly me or anybody would find. But she found them in her wandering and in her waiting and frankly in her suffering. So come back. This time is hard. There's no doubt about it. Everyone is suffering. It was a tease that we got a piece of potential and now we're pulled back. Who knows where we are? Here's my charge to you. Here's my blessing for you. My blessing for me and for all of us. Let us take this time and see this time. Not just about what we don't have. Not just about what got canceled. Not only about what we lost, which is true. And it's okay to be upset about that, to fetch and struggle. That's in our tradition too. But what else are the sparks of light, the wisdom, the appreciation? Perhaps we appreciate medical workers like we never did before. Perhaps it's a time to focus on the attribute of patience, what it means truly to be patient. By wearing a mask so long, may it make us appreciate and remember those people who have trouble breathing or say they cannot breathe under normal circumstances. This time, we, although we did not ask for it, is a time for spiritual growth and learning. Our people yearned for thousands of years for, the, for Israel, for thousands of years for the Messiah, for 40 years. I think we too can use their wisdom to not only see the waiting and yearning as wasted time, but perhaps it's spark gathering time. In this year to come, I invite us when things are tough, when things, when the go worse, and you know, who knows what the winter will be like, how this continues. Turn to each other, turn to people you love, turn to yourself, and say, be a spark gatherer. Not just a complainer, not just someone who struggles and cries, although that's appropriate, but also one who gathers divine sparks, because according to the Kabbalah, they are there in our wandering, and in our wandering, we be able to collect them. 
And when God willing, this is over and we're in the promised land of post-COVID, we will not be the same people. We will be different because we accrued these sparks of light and we'll bring them to our future, to ourselves, to our people, and to the world. And in that way, we truly will not only gather sparks of light, we will be a spark of light. That is the message of our waiting. That is our people's wisdom around waiting. May we get there soon with as many sparks as we can gather in the process. Shana tova umetuka.